Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, uh, John DeLynn, and actually today is a joint uh, episode. This, this, uh, this episode is brought to you both by Mormon Stories Podcast and the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis Podcast. For those of you Mormon Stories listeners who uh, don't know, uh, earlier this year, Natasha Alfred Parker, uh, Margie DeLynn, my wife, and I started this podcast. Uh, we're about 35, 40 episodes in, and it's all about providing you with personal, practical, um, and uh, personal, practical, and uh, one other. <laughs> There's, There's three another P's. P in there somewhere. Personal, practical. What else is there? Uh, anyway, <laughs> tips and tricks for navigating your faith crisis. It's a great website, mormonfaithcrisis.com. Uh, we've been doing great work there. And that's more of sort of the practical how-to stuff that Natasha, Margie, and I do. Mormon Stories is more about the stories. Um, we have already interviewed Alan and Katie Mount uh, last week, four hours on their amazing epic uh, journey uh, through Mormonism, and Alan has stepped away from the church. Katie is still a believing member, and they started this amazing podcast uh, called Marriage on a Tightrope. And um, so we interviewed them about their journey, about how they have uh, thrived in their marriage as a mixed-faith couple, and why they started the podcast. And if you haven't checked that out, it's a story very much worth listening to. Positive, practical, and personal. That's the three P's, positive. So um, today's episode is, uh, is all about Alan and Katie's uh, tips and tricks. They Not only have they navigated successfully so far a mixed faith marriage, but they, as they told us in their episode last week, have met with many, many couples over the past year and have uh, been thinking a lot about this and have been trying to gather wisdom uh, for other mixed faith couples. And so um, earlier last month in June of 2019, uh, a few awesome committee members and I held a conference called Thrive 2019. It was held in Salt Lake City. And we invited as many of the coolest people as we could gather to present on several really cool topics. So Natasha Alfred Parker talked about healthy sexuality, um, Anthony Miller talked about, you know, navigating a faith crisis gracefully. David Bakavoy talked about spirituality. Um, I gave a talk. Uh, Margie gave a talk. Uh, Gary and Ernie gave an awesome talk. All these amazing people gave cool talks. Alan and Katie gave a talk on navigating a mixed faith marriage. And so instead of just sharing the audio recording of that presentation, um, and we also didn't get consent from the audience participants uh, to share their audio. What we decided to do was to bring them back in for today's episode to have them share the presentation with us, and then we're going to talk about it. So this is going to be about a two-hour episode, and we are going to hear Alan and Katie's tips on navigating a mixed-faith marriage in a Mormon context. And this is sort of like the first in the series on Mormon stories that we are going to be having on um, interviewing several successful Mormon mixed faith couples. Now, Alan and Katie already, already do that on Marriage on a Tightrope, so we certainly want you to check out their podcast. But there can't be enough good stories to be told about healthy Mormon mixed faith marriages. And so, and, and we may even interview some of the same people because we swim in a relatively small pond, but we just want to spam the world with good role models for healthy mixed faith marriages. It's a win-win for everybody. So if you are in a healthy, successful Mormon mixed faith marriage and you haven't already reached out to us, or even if you have, reach out to us, email us at mormonstories at gmail.com, and we would love to consider you guys to be interviewed to tell your story of how you've made your Mormon mixed faith marriage successful. Um, so I think that's the introduction. This is going to be visual, and so... Um, we have some PowerPoint slides, so if you want to check out our YouTube page, we think this is going to be at least posted to the Mormon Stories podcast YouTube page. It may also be posted to the Mormon Faith Crisis YouTube uh, page as well. Um, and this audio is going to be jointly released on the on the Mormon Stories and the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis um, podcast uh, audio streams. And of course, you guys are welcome to share it as well as you want. Okay. 
So uh, thanks to everyone joining us live on Facebook. We really appreciate the support. We know a lot of tightropers are probably going to be tuning in. Tightropers are the name that, that Katie and Alan use to refer to their wonderful audience. And I learned last episode that that comes from the movie The Greatest Showman. Uh, the Greatest Show? Is it which one? Uh, hey, greatest Showman. Yeah. And uh, Margie and I love that musical as well. So that's enough of the intros. So without any further ado, welcome back to Mormon Stories Podcast slash welcome to the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis Podcast. It's good to have you guys. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for ha having us back. <laughs> it's an honor to be the first returning guests on Mormon Stories ever. It's never happened before, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you're the, you're the first couple to return the weekend after your move. Per, see, if you add enough details, we're the first at something. <laughs> Everyone's the first at something. That's right. That's right. No, thanks for having us. We're excited to, to dig in. Yeah, and folks really loved our interview last week, and I did too, and it, it was so epic that we had to punt, but I'm glad we're going to be able to give a good two solid hours to this topic. Um, awesome. And we also want to welcome or invite our Facebook live listeners to post their stories, their questions, their comments, and we'll integrate them into this discussion as well. I also want to encourage you guys to please uh, share this interview um, on social media. Let other people know, hey... You know, there's this cool interview on mixed Mormon mixed faith marriages. Please share it uh, on Facebook and on social media so we can have as many listeners as possible. That'd be great. All right, so let's uh, let's begin. What do you? How do you guys begin this uh, presentation on counseling Mormon mixed faith couples? How did we start it at the at the conference? Uh, we were so excited, first of all, to just be invited to participate at the conference. We had probably what twenty to twenty five couples in the audience with us. And <clears throat> a lot of what we started talking about was uh, what we'll skip today uh, was our story. So we started by telling a little bit of our story. Uh, those that have listened to our podcast are probably sick of, it, of that by Give now. Give them the few minute version, just the, for, for those who didn't listen to the four hours, but are just tuning into this, give them the high level version. I believed and then I didn't <laughs> and we're making it work. That, that, that's the super high level version. Uh, a lot of, of my faith crisis had to do with um, loss of my father, which opened me up emotionally to look at some, some truth claim issues, which led me down the rabbit hole and uh, a, a common tale with its own personal twists and turns. Right. That's a, that's a decent, decent summary. Yeah, that's a decent summary. <laughs> and I'm, still in. I'm the primary president and I have been for the last three years and um, him going through this. So I've been doing that ever, ever since the start of it. It's probably worth mentioning uh, because we're about to start talking about some of the, these lessons learned that we've talked about on our podcast, why you started the podcast. Oh, I started the podcast uh, because I didn't feel like there's a roadmap and there weren't any resources um, to help those in my position. I felt like there was lots of support on Alan's side, but not really any for my side. So then I brought the idea to Alan, and now here we are a year and a half later doing the podcast and sitting down with John. So we've reached the top, I think. <laughs> I think <laughs> you're the top, John. You're the top, John. For now. <clears throat> for now. I'll take it for <laughs> We're working on, on overtaking you. You could do it. We're working, <laughs> on it. We're working on it. I'll be thrilled. <laughs> the more the merrier. <laughs> uh, every episode we start uh, with a little catchphrase and we take turns saying it. Um, but every episode we say, hey, welcome to the Marriage on a Tightrope podcast. I'm Alan. And I'm Katie. And we're still married. Uh, that's our that's our little catchphrase. We've received a little bit of a few complaints, <laughs> but um, we want to make. I mean, it's it's supposed to be a very. This is a very difficult uh, situation to find yourself in, and so right off the bat, in every single episode, we we try to not make light of a difficult situation, but but to keep it light, keep the conversation light, focusing on positive things, and remind everyone like, hey, we can make this work. So what we want to talk about today is some of those things that we've learned, mistakes that we've made that hopefully if we can share, um, other people don't have to make them in order to learn from them. Uh, that's really the, the hope that we have for these next few hours. All right. Let's dig in. All right. So uh, getting off of that title slide, do we have a volunteer to read um, this Brene Brown quote? John, I will. Katie, you got it? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, this quote is by Brene Brown, and she says, the best marriages are the ones where we can go out in the world and really put ourselves out there. A lot of times we'll fail and sometimes we'll put it off, but good marriages are when you can go home and know that your vulnerability will be honored as courage and that you'll find support. Yeah, that it's that last part of that quote that we, we really wanted to start the presentation off with. That your vulnerability will be honored as courage and that you'll find support. Wow, that's a really good, succinct, you know, uh, summary of what mixed faith marriages need. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. we, uh, do we agree on everything, Katie? No. We don't. <laughs> we don't. We don't. And that's, that's all right. Uh, the, the quote doesn't say anything about uh, agreement or make, uh, being on the same page doesn't have to mean that you agree with everything, but your vulnerability will be honored. Uh, so we can jump to that, the next slide, which basically is just an introduction to the lessons learned with a huge fat asterisk. And John, I think it's appropriate if you read that asterisk. It's on slide. Uh, it's the slide that says section three, lessons learned with an asterisk. All right. It says, these have been our experiences. We aren't licensed professionals. Just a couple of crazy kids willing to tell their story in a super public way. Yeah. All right. So we're not. You are. <laughs> so as we go through this, uh, when we presented at the conference as well, Natasha Alfred Parker was in the audience. Uh, so that was very helpful. Um, anything that we, that we talk about on our podcast, we try to preface it with, we're just sharing our lived experience um, this may not be what you experience and go to a professional if, if you really want to get down into the dirty details. All so, right. Yeah. The, the first thing, and what we'll do is we had an episode, a couple of paired episodes about a little over a month ago, I think, where I walked through six tips for the non-believing spouse. And then the next episode, Katie walked through six tips for the believing spouse. Uh, and really every single tip is trying to build bridges between the two uh, to, to help strengthen the, the marriage and the communication in the marriage. So what we'll do is we'll kind of ping pong back and forth and talk about these tips. And we have short little stories to tell where each of these tips came from. Oh, okay. So you're going to do a tip for a believing spouse. And, and then, then we'll a do a tip for And you alternate back and forth. Yes. That's right. That's okay, right. Okay. That'll keep Cody busy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we're, we're now on the, the next slide, which is six tips for supporting your believing spouse. Okay. Uh, so these are the six tips that I would give to the, for lack of a better term, non-believing spouse or the transitioning spouse to support their believing spouse. Uh, we talked about some of this last episode, but the first would be um, use language of what works versus um, doesn't work instead of true and not true or right and wrong. Um, using language of, uh, for example, going to church, like this just, it does not work for me. It's so painful. Is a lot healthier in a mixed faith marriage than turning to your spouse and saying, I cannot support an organization that has lied and 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 forced me to serve a mission when I didn't want to, or it was false pretense. It, there's there's a right, or a good, and a and a less good way of of talking about what works for you. So that language is super important. Yeah. So so in a in, and let's just back up for a second. Like, and you're probably going to get to this. But sure. One of the hardest things about a mixed faith marriage is that it's the non-believer that broke the deal. M most Mormon marriages are entered into under the understanding that both are going to be Orthodox believers, that you're going to be committed to the church until you die, that you're going to have lots of kids, they're going to go on missions, they're going to marry in the temple, and that you're going to have family meeting and scripture study and be a righteous, you know, priest holder slash relief society person or whatever right, right. the female equivalent is, and that you'll end up being grandparents and serving missions. And it's always the non-believer that breaks that deal. Mm -hmm. And so it's really interesting. We're starting with the believing spouse and we're starting by saying you're going to have to reconsider sort of the, uh, the true, not true, or the, the kind of the binary worldview, right? That all the world's either, you know, things in the world are either true or they're false, that things are good or they're bad, that they're right or they're wrong. Now, is there, is it intentional that Alan, you're you're speaking about the tips for the believing spouse? So the tips are actually for the non-believing spouse, but they're for supporting the believing spouse. 
Okay. So the tips okay, are, got yeah, it. the tips are, I'm speaking in the episode, okay. it's a solo episode, and I'm talking directly to the non-believer on how would, they can support their believing spouse. Would it be bad if we if we did them together instead of alternating back and forth? Tell me your logic in that. No, that we can do that. Um, yeah, it, it was just a presentation style so that okay. one person's not speaking for So I'm going to incorporate you both, but I think it might be easier for our listeners if you're okay. Yeah, yeah that's fine. If we go in a block. Okay. Sure. That's fine. So... I like it that, okay, so these are tips for the, the non-believer. Correct. And I like that we're starting there because it's the non-believer that broke the deal. Right. Right? It's the non-believer that changed. Now, of course, as someone who's who has been a non-believer, right, I understand. I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of. I don't think you've done a bad thing. I don't think you need to hang your head in shame. At the same time, I have this philosophy and I want to see if you've already got this in your slides, that there is a little, I, I like to tell non-believers when I counsel mixed faith couples that they have a little bit more of a, of a burden or an onus or responsibility than the believer. Do you want to fill in the blanks or do you want me to keep talking? No, go ahead. That's no, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Yeah. Well, tell me why. And then I'll, I'll cause it's more of the interview of you than me. Yeah. I mean, a lot of non-believers uh, would say, I didn't choose this. Uh, I didn't choose this to happen. I wanted to stay. And while that certainly is true, uh, the change is happening to me and it's being forced upon her. Um, yeah. So I think that when you, when Alan came to his conclusions, he did so in more of a natural way. You know, he went down the rabbit hole and he studied and then he finally came to his conclusion that all of these things added up, um, he decided that he can no longer believe in that. Um, when the non-believing spouse uses language, um, especially to, to the believing spouse that says, you know, you're wrong. That's actually not truthful. Um, I, I haven't been able to come to any sort of natural conclusion. Things are being thrust upon me or thrown at me. Um, his opinion and, and how he feels. And, um, that, that can be really harsh in my opinion. And so him saying things like, uh, well, this doesn't work for me. This is hard for me. Those, that type of language helps me to try and understand rather than feel attacked. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I think, well, go ahead. If you no, fine. Um, <laughs> I'll go the, I think that, um, some of the difficult things for the non-believer that is leaving is, is thinking about and wondering what people are thinking about you. I mean, I've, I was in for 35 years. And so the reasons why people leave the church are they're lazy and they want to sin and they now they want to drink alcohol and, and they just don't want to go to church anymore. They'd rather go hiking or play sports or whatever it may be. Uh, and so I personally feel like I want to both very actively be an example that does not fit those descriptions. I want to be an example, take the burden, like in your language, John, take the burden on myself to show neighbors, friends, and family that, that it's not quite as simple as, as you think. It's, it's not clear cut and it's not all on me um, for the reasons why uh, I've left. It's not what you may think. Yeah, I love it. And I think what I was trying to get at just as a framing for these six points is that I believe that the non-believer has a bit more of an onus or a burden to be a little more compassionate, to be a little more patient, to be more flexible in how they approach. Because even though it's not their fault, even though they're not a bad person, even though they're following integrity and honesty and truth, they're the ones who change the deal. Right. And so I like that we're starting with, with recommendations for them because, you know, you've had months or even years to work through your stuff. By the time your believing spouse knows that you're going through a hard time, right. it's going to be kind of newer for them, and it's going to be a shock, and it's going to be hard, and frankly, it, they're going to perceive it as a bait and switch, that you married me, we had this deal, these covenants were made for eternity, and now you're breaking it. And so I, I, it's easy for the non-believer to get caught up in the anger and the frustration and the resentment and the feelings of betrayal and shock and all that stuff and to want to go crazy in their life, but also be crazy and patient with their believing spouse. And I, I like that, that we're, I, I like to make that call to the non-believer, chill out, 
take an extra pa- uh, extra dose of patience and compassion and empathy and realize that you're going to need to maybe even burden a little bit more of the responsibility in these early phases yeah. while your spouse is just like trying to orient themselves to this completely new, shocking, uh, devastating in some ways reality. Yeah. Now, am I overstating that, Katie, or does that resonate with you? No. Yeah. You're right on the money. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this first bullet point then is, is basically saying non-believer take a different approach instead of, you know, adopting this binary worldview and it's all a cult and it's all false and, and it's not true and it's wrong. You could, I could almost argue that's playing into the church's paradigm, the orthodox religious paradigm of seeing the world in black and white. Right. And, and part of the beauty of a faith crisis or a transition is to see the world as a multicolored spectrum anyway. But, it, but aside from the fact that, you know, we can see the world in more than just black and white, it's just not useful right. to, to focus on you're wrong and the church isn't true and I'm right, it's not useful. So no. focusing instead on what what works, I think that's a great suggestion. Yeah, the, the quick real world story um, <clears throat> that is pretty recent, just about a month ago, Katie's sister had a baby blessing and um, uh, even attending for an hour can be difficult for me still. So when we went, I went to support the family and, and went in there and uh, you can imagine sitting there, they call for the baby to be blessed. And what's going through my mind, all the men are standing up, they're walking up to the front and I'm not, I'm sitting there with all the women and children, nothing against women and children, but I'm the only guy standing or sitting there. And then the testimonies start after that. And they're saying things that I'm, I'm just putting my head in my hands. And all of a sudden it's, I, I couldn't be there anymore. I had to leave in the middle of sacrament. So the point of telling that story is one, um, you don't have, don't feel like everyone has this figured out or that just because we are vocal about it on a podcast means that we don't have any more problems about it. It's a daily thing and it still happens. She had a, her sister had a mission reunion yesterday. Farewell. Uh, excuse me. Mission uh, farewell yesterday. And I went and it was a lot better than the baby blessing. Uh, and it was, it was a good, it was a good thing. The baby blessing uh, experience taught me something. Uh, after the baby blessing, I talked to Katie and my message to her wasn't, um, how dare they bless a baby with a fake priesthood that was never a thing. That wasn't, that wasn't the story. It was, it is so hard for me to be in there, uh, knowing or feeling and thinking like, ugh, your mom or your sister or whoever is going to be looking at me going like, well, you should be up there. And, and these messages that are being talked about, you know, uh, from the stand are, are super difficult for me. Like, it's just hard and it hurts me to be there. It had nothing to do with true versus not true. Um, and full credit to Katie, she, she apologized and we'll actually talk about that. That's one of her, one of her tips is how she reacted to, to me bringing that up. I love it. So, so I often talk about anger being a secondary emotion that, that it, it's natural to be angry. Anger's healthy. If you go back to the Gift of the Mormon Faith Crisis podcast, we do a whole episode series on um, on coping with, with emotions and on the grieving process, which includes anger. And what we say back then and what we'll say repeatedly is that always under the anger, there's either fear or sadness or disappointment. And what I just heard you say, Alan and Katie, I want to get your feedback on this. If you speak from the place of anger as a non-believer or the believer, it's the church is wrong and the church is bad and you you don't understand me and the church is a bad experience. And it's just making the believer feel what, Katie? Um, yeah, I feel bad. And, bad? Um, disappointed. Disappointed. <laughs> How about defensive? Defensive. Yeah, I've, there are many times where I double down on my stances because things were being talked about in a heated way. Yeah. So it really puts up a wall. So when, when Alan goes to instead, this makes me sad, this hurts me when I go, or, or this type of experience makes me feel sad or hurt, what does that do for you? Um, so it definitely gives me more compassion for him and how he's feeling. It makes me 
my senses very aware and heightened because I will hear the messages that I think about in his lenses and through his ears. I'll hear them and I'll feel bad that he's sitting there listening to them because I know how much they hurt. Yeah. And so definitely um, using language that describes feelings versus anger Mm. helps in the situation. Yeah, those primary emotions. Let me ask you this. What we're basically asking this first bullet is for the the non-believer to move away from language that reflects this binary worldview, this true, false, good, or bad. Many people associate Orthodox Mormonism with that binary worldview, true, false, black, white, good, bad. Mm-hmm. Do, how do you feel about that worldview? Do you see the world now in black, white? And I also had a listener who just said, Katie, how have your beliefs changed You know, since Alan's gone through his faith crisis? But just going back to sort of a targeted question, is it... Are you still in that binary worldview, black, white, good, bad, false, true? Or have you moved to a different place now where you kind of, because, because if I'm, if we're recommending to non-believers to not speak from that standpoint, it assumes that you're not only in that sort of black and white worldview anyway. Does that make sense? Yeah, there definitely has been a paradigm shift for me as well. Later in the, in the slides, we'll talk about embracing the gray Okay. Because there is a lot of gray, and before I saw things very black and white. And so now that I feel like I understand more, I have compassion, I can, I can see both sides, um, I can also say the church still works for me, even though it doesn't work for him. And that, that's you using that same language right. that right. Alan's recommending. I love it. Right. Okay, that's a great first bullet. Cool. Thanks for letting us kind of frame it a little bit. No, I love yeah. it. I love it. Okay. All right, number two. Uh, ask your spouse what they value about their participation in the church and then support them in that. So that goes right along with what Katie just shared on It Still Works For Me. So um, there was a moment uh, last summer when we were in the backyard on our patio. I was a little frustrated that I was alone every Sunday and that the kids and Katie were going to church every Sunday. And I just, just let it out and just, why can't we just go on a hike? Why can't we just as a family going to hike? Why does it always have to be church? Why do it always have to be alone here? And I, we had had that conversation a couple of times, but this one kind of came out in a panic, panicked way. And Katie's response, um, Katie's response was, you know, I love serving in primary. And primary to me is how I experience the divine. And that's how I serve God. And for whatever reason, it didn't bounce off my ego shell. It, it sunk in. And at that time, I just thought, who am I to want to strip that away and, and take that away from her? And then she very logically said, why can't we do both? Church is only two hours. <laughs> now. <laughs> now, uh, especially. So it's a lot easier now. But why can't we do both? Um, we'll go to church, and I'll experience what I need to experience there, and I'll serve God, and I'll, I'll serve the kids. I would rather have, I would not rather, well, what's the right way to say this? I am glad that Katie is the primary president. I think that she is amazing at it, and I trust those kids in her hands more than anyone else's. So I don't want to take that away from the kids either. I think she provides a lot of value for them. Uh, So that it really sunk in of just ask the question directly, what do you value about your participation in church? And then help help with that. Putting videos on thumb drives is one thing that I do for Katie. <laughs> Anything that has to do with technical. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I've got this lesson and uh, I need help with this, this tech support stuff, getting a video on a thumb drive or setting up a laptop or whatever it may be. And for me, that's, that's easy for me to say, I can support you in that because you've told me that that's important to you. A Mormon Stories, we, we often reference Dr. Dave Christian's presentation that he gave in 2011 about um, the, the two different approaches to Mormonism. One is the, the validity perspective, which is it's either true or false. But there's also the utility perspective, which is, is does it work or not? And what, what this bullet speaks to me about is tapping in. And, and it's often the, 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 the male on average tends to be more, have more of the validity uh, sort of perspective and the female on average tends to have more of the utility perspective. And what I'm hearing this bullet basically say is tap into your spouse's articulation of the validity, yeah. uh, 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 no, the of utility. the utility 
because that's really what it's all about. At the end of the day, we're just all trying to survive life. And if the church helps you be a happier, healthier person, a parent, a spouse, a human, if it helps with your anxiety or depression, if it just makes you happy, like you said, why would you want to take that away? Right. So, so Katie, tell us really quickly, articulate other than serving in primary, what, what do you value about attending church? What are the things that you really get, for, get from it right now? I would say I have always valued community. That's a big thing to me. And I'm a really extroverted social person. So having that like built in community has always been so helpful to me. Are you like when you go to church, are you talking to everybody and saying hi to everybody and like you kind of like the life of the party, social mm-hmm. butterfly? People I do. love her. Yeah. I I <laughs> that'd be I a big just, loss to like lose that, that right? I right. It would be it would be hard. I recognize that in the neighborhood I live in, in the schools that my kids attend, that there is an that community is built in. And we have plenty of friends who are not in the church, who live in our neighborhood, who we play with and we do things with. But I also know that having that added piece of the church is important for me and for the kids. And so that's a big part of it. I like my love language is service. And I find a lot of joy in serving others and I find a lot of joy in helping. And, um, so that, that's a big thing for me also. And, you know, there, I think music speaks to me and I love, I love Mormon music. I've always listened to Motab or whatever it may be, whatever it is uplifting on Sundays and so that's really speaks to my heart too. And I think the other thing is pre- people's personal stories. When I hear someone talk about their life, I like hearing about it. And and I think that that's something very unique to Mormons. Um, you know, you whether you agree with what they say or not, every week they stand up and they talk about something that was hard for them. They share something that's personal to them, and that really. I think helps me. We've been to a few different churches uh, where we've heard sermons and they are, they're awesome. There's, there are a lot of good pastors out there, a lot of good sermons out there and they prepare well. But I think there's something to be said about uh, letting people just talk from their heart. So I, I gain, I get a lot of, out of, out of that. And let me just ask you how, where you've evolved in your faith right now, how important is it Do you even think about the church in terms of like true false, like church is true, church is, you know, do do you even think about it that way? A a natural evolution is just to say the church is good or the church works for me, not the church is true. Do you characterize the church as being true now? That's a good question. I Is that even important to you? I don't, I, it was important to me. It was absolutely important to me. I don't know that I like will say the church is a hundred percent true. I don't think there's so. Good and bad, right? I think there's good and bad with everything. I uh, there and there are good doctrine. And bad in other churches, right? Yeah, that you can say that for any church. And I think there's doctrine that I still find really beautiful, and and things that I still have a hope for. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. yeah, embracing some of that gray. And it's so interesting. Sometimes non-believers are just like, no, it's either true or false. And if it's true, I'll give it everything. But if it's not true, then we need to burn it down. And that that's fine if that's a perspective. It's probably not a useful perspective in a mixed faith marriage. It's certainly not. But also it's it's a not it's not a respectful it, it's a it's 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 one limited perspective that doesn't respect another perspective, which is all institutions are flawed. There's no such thing as a perfect country, no such thing as a perfect marriage, no such thing as a perfect church. So all we have is is to deal with institutions and organizations that are imperfect. This is the one that calls to me. This is the one that speaks to me. This works for me. And honestly, I meet so many people that are just like, I don't care if it's true or not. And can we as non-believers be tolerant to the fact that some people just don't care if it's true or not, if it's good, if it's useful, that's enough for them. And can we as non-believers get comfortable with that? <laughs> right, right, right. I can. I can. I <laughs> yeah. would still attend if if right. if a lot of the focus was on good 
um, versus true, I would absolutely be there. And I'm hopeful that at some point that will be the case. Right. Um, I think there are a lot of wards that, that are better at that than, than others. Right. Um, all right. Number so that's three. Good. Yeah. Ask your spouse what they value about their participation in church and support them in that. I love it. Okay. Three. Ask what their fears are with your newfound beliefs and validate what they say. I think this one needs to be asked often. Um, it's because going it back can to change. those primary emotions, right? Right. Instead of fighting about truth claims, what do you do? Yeah. We were at uh, dinner on my birthday last year, and I asked this question to Katie of what are your what are your next fears about this whole journey and this whole process? And what'd me? you say? I think I what said biggest, alcohol. What have been your biggest fears? I think alcohol. That's a very common that first was, one. Was yep. number one. What else? Uh, oh, that you would stop going to church. Okay, did he stop going to church? Because at that point I knew that he didn't believe and it was hard for him, but I was so afraid to be to be stuck at church on the pew with four kids yeah, and all so like all of the very judging eyes and comments that would come my way. Yeah. I didn't want that because I don't, I don't like attention that way. Mm -hmm. So I think some of the, the and really it's more like the, the pity looks not so much judging, but just like, are you okay? And that can really set you Or off. the comments that, that people will say, Oh, your kids will thank you for this one day because I don't actually know if my kids will stay in the church one right. day or you're doing your best. I know for some people, those types of comments are helpful for me. They were not. Well, what if they're like, we're so sorry that I've gotten that many times. <laughs> what, what, what's, or what, a, what's offensive about that? We're, oh, like, because like, or that, is it offensive? that we're, well, yeah, it's offensive because it assumes that our marriage is in a bad place. Yeah. It, it assumes. What's implied about Alan? Yeah. It assumes that he's gone off the deep end and now I'm <laughs> stuck dealing with everything else. He may as well be like a drug dealer, right? Right. <laughs> or a convict. Right? <laughs> I haven't tried that one yet. I don't, I don't think I'm going to go that way. I don't think I'm going to go that way. So yeah, her answer was alcohol and church, church attendance. That was March of 2018. So fast forward a year and a half almost, and guess what? I no longer attend church, and I have tried alcohol. Ooh. Um, and those things were not taken lightly, uh, especially considering that's what she requested. But here's the, the kind of the, the interesting point of that is that the things that are concerning for her, and you can certainly, of course, speak for yourself, um, the, it changes. And that's why you need to have the conversation often. Because over time, she saw a year and a half to two years of church attendance just was not working anymore. It was so, so draining and so hurtful for me to continue to beat my head against the wall at church every, every single Sunday that when it finally got to that place where I said, I can't do it anymore, it, she, she got it. It was nine months after that conversation at, at Sawadi, a good uh, Thai place. Uh, little plug for them. I've been there. It's great. W was that hard to get to the point where you could release him from attending church? Yeah. I think I need uh, lots of notice because if you listen to our last interview, I like my to-do list. I like, know what, I like knowing what's coming. I like having an itinerary. So talking thing, about things ahead of time and not having them sprung on me was really helpful for me. I, uh, that, that was something that I needed. So how are you handling church now alone? Is it hard? Is it? I know. I think we're used to it. You, it got. It became okay. It's fine. Yeah. A couple other common fears are like you're going to sleep around, you're going to cheat on me, or you're going to end the marriage. Did you ever have those fears? Certainly. Yeah. We had. Uh, we had a listener who. To be, uh, well, long story short, their spouse left the church and then found someone on the ex-Mormon subreddit and started going back and forth with them, and they ended up together. Mm. And that is was a huge fear of mine uh, because, and we'll talk about it in my slide, but one of the things that you're concerned about is when you can't hear the information that he wants to express he'll express it to someone else. And I was afraid that there would be some of that emotional connection with someone else. Yeah. And that's, that really, uh, that was in the back of my mind and we talked about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll just reiterate talking about fears. Number one, it gets to the primary emotions instead of again, things like anger, which is secondary and it's peripheral. 
Um, it also helps to build that intimacy. So if we go back to that Brene Brown quote, right, where where she basically said at the end that your vulnerability will be honored as courage and that you'll find support. Th this is where the where uh, mixed faith marriage can become this huge gift, because as you start going to your fears and your sadnesses and your insecurities, and you start being vulnerable with each other. Then you get to know each other at a more intimate level. You show up for each other. You give each other that support, that unconditional love. And sometimes for the first time in a multi-decade marriage, you can start really showing each other really solid, strong, uh, compelling emotional intimacy, which, which can take your love to a whole new level. So it's not just a good tip. It's actually like the bedrock of a really strong marriage. Mm -hmm. When you get comfortable talking about your fears with each other, being vulnerable, but then supporting each other, validating each other, knowing that you're there for each other, that becomes a great foundation yeah. for a better marriage, not a worse one. Right. So you kind of can't lose if you go to the fears. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Uh, this plays into and the And I next, love val yeah. the, the validate what they say. Talk about that because I think validation's huge, and it's yeah. stuff that we're so bad at. Right, you know, I think the alcohol one is is a good example of that. Where when she expressed that, I thought, I don't. At the time, it was like I don't really care. My curiosity is not worth more to me than than validating what she's saying. She's really afraid of that, and at this point, trying alcohol is pretty low on the list, and it's it's just a curious thing. It's not like a I will not be held back. I will be authentic. I didn't feel that way at the time. And so um, the way that I was able to validate, I feel um, her concerns there was not jumping into something that wasn't killing me anyway. Um, and I mean, that was March 29th of 2018. And it wasn't until April of 2019 that I had my first drink, which leads to the next point of don't hide behavioral changes. Yeah. Um, that's a big one. A big part of mixed faith marriage is, is trust. You have to trust each other. And if you're hiding changes, uh, you're breaking trust. And the dilemma is that, you know, you, you lose your faith, but you're scared to tell your believing spouse because you're scared they'll leave you. You're scared they'll divorce you. You're scared they'll take the kids. You're scared they'll tell your parents or your siblings or your in-laws or whatever that, you know, and, and all of a sudden you're just petrified about, or you're worried about your job or whatever it is. And so you don't tell them what's really going on. And then, like you said, you start confiding in, in a woman that you knew from high school or a coworker or, you know, whoever, and you start these behavioral changes, secretly drinking at work or on the road, secretly taking your garments off on the road whatever it is you do privately, secretly. I've even had people tell me they stopped paying tithing, but didn't tell their spouse and made their spouse think that they were still paying tithing. And uh, there are all sorts of problems with that. What are the problems from the believing standpoint? What's the problem with the non... You can see why a, a, a non-believer would hide their behavior, right, Katie? Yeah, because I think that the first initial reaction that I have is anger. Yeah. And it comes from fear, just like you talked about. But when something is hidden, it amplifies that, that fear. Right. Because everything that you are fearing is happening and your partner isn't communicating that to you. And so when, and it breaks trust and it does so over and over and over again. So yeah. you yeah. have to be very open with any changes, anything that you do. We've, we have hard, fast rules in our marriage about alcohol and about a few other things. So if he's going to drink, have a drink with a friend or he just sends me a quick text, Hey, I'm going to have a drink with a client. Then I know Then I don't sit and wonder and I question and I worry about it. And it's not a permission thing. Like no. I don't, I don't feel like I need her permission to do anything. It's just a, I understand and, and I get that she, that, alcohol particularly is a hot topic for her. And I understand that I'm a 37 year old that has never drank before. And that's a whole new world to me as well. And so if I can be very, very open with her about that behavior, there's, it's a little less, uh, there's not as much tension, if any, um, when it comes to that topic. Mm -hmm. Fair to say. Yeah. So I, I mean, real quickly, I'll tell the, the first drink that I had, it's, 
it's annoyingly cute. I think the story <laughs> is super cute because <laughs> we had just accepted, uh, our offer had just been accepted on the home we just moved into. And I closed the deal I'd been working on forever at work. Uh, it, we found out both things within a few hours of each other. So we were, I was super, super excited. And I said, hey, tonight, let's go out on the trampoline, put a blanket out, look at the stars, and we'll celebrate. I'll bring two different kinds of liquids. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And she's like, okay, all right, well, let's see how that goes. And to me, that was like, ooh, doors open. Okay, this is going to be a thing. So I ran across the street to my to our neighbor's house, who they're not members of the church, never have been, knocked on their door. They've been a part of this whole journey for me because they've just been a sounding board of like, hey, this is what's happening now. This is why I'm home on Sunday, blah, blah, blah. And they, they gave me a, a little, um, a gosh, I called it a vial in the, in the Thrive Conference and everyone made a mini, of bottle, a mini bottle, I think is the, the correct term. Yeah. A vial. A gave bottle, me it's not a, a vial. It's like a manalchemist. They gave me a, um, a mini bottle of Fireball, which is cinnamon whiskey. That's so popular with post Mormons. That's what I've heard. And yeah. I didn't know anything about anything at this point. They just said, here, just do this real quick. And they gave me two mini bottles. And so that night we go out into the, onto the trampoline. I pour her some Martinelli's. I pour myself some, <laughs> some uh, Fireball. <laughs> and we make a toast and we say congrats. And I, and I drink it and I, kinda, I just talked her through. She asked me a couple of questions. Like, How does it taste? I'm like, well, it, it's cinnamony. It's really sweet. It's like a melted um, atomic Fireball candy. And then I swallowed it, and well, how does it feel? Well, it's a little, it's burning my throat a little bit, and now I feel it warm in my chest a little bit. It's like Nyquil, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Robitussin. And she, and she was like, okay, and and I I wanted it to be a non-event. I didn't want it to be this big thing, so I didn't like try to kiss her with alcohol in my breath afterwards. I really was <laughs> wanted to be super careful that this was a. Just like, a, oh, that happened, and then we moved on. And so right. right after that, we we got off of the tramp, went in and watched an episode of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I brushed my teeth, and then I kissed her. And so <laughs> um, uh, hopefully that that event was a healthy way to introduce something that could be very difficult in a relationship. So how was that for you, Katie? Like, that's, a, that's one of the huge barriers. Some of the things that induce panic are, like, taking off your garments, trying alcohol, trying marijuana, and then anything sexual, porn, or anything around sexuality, those are some of the really big ones. Uh, and I, I, you know, I'll admit, I haven't tried alcohol yet. It's been 18 years since I lost my faith. I still haven't tried it. Um, so I want to support people who just decide they don't want to have that in their sure. lives. But I'm glad we're talking about it. For, you know, for a believer, that's one of the big ones that induces panic. Uh, but it's also something a lot of post-Mormons just really want to try. How did you get over that panic? How did you work through that? Well, I mean, or when we you? first talked about it, 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 it was over a year. A year. Yeah. So, you, you, okay, so a year helps. It was over a year. Time helps. Time helps. I, we early on, and this is not anything bad, but Alan would make sort of joking comments about me joining him. And that put undue stress and pressure on me. Pressure. Yeah. And I, and that made me want to reject it even more. And then we had this conversation that I said, I don't, I don't like the pressure I feel, even with the joking comments. It doesn't, doesn't make me feel good. I don't want it. And so he stopped making the joking comments. And then I kind of felt like it was time. He had waited a full year. He wanted to try it. I knew he did. And he did, it, he did so in a way where it felt safe. It was just within our own home, just the two of us. It wasn't a big deal. And that was it. So so a couple of things I hear is be patient, give it, patient time, give it time. Don't rush your believing spouse with all these big changes. You've gone your whole life, many of you, not all of you, some of you, or you've gone a decade or two potentially without any of these things. Do you really need to rush that right when they're dealing with some of the really hard stuff? Give it time, be patient, be respectful communicate directly, yeah. don't pressure the spouse. Yeah. And then when it's time, when you've got them to settle, because you got to remember a faith crisis triggers that amygdala. It triggers that fight or flight, uh, you know, a neural system that is literally designed to, you know, save us from a lion that's running after us, trying to eat us. A faith crisis triggers that in the brain of the believer. So, you know, you get dumber when that, when that amygdala is triggered. You lose 10 to 20 IQ points. 
and while they're in that, and sometimes they're in that state for weeks or months, um, you, you don't want to add complexity to that. So just have compassion, give it time, be respectful, don't pressure. And, and in their case, they work through it. Other relationships may be different. I love that. I want to add a couple extra things sure. about these behavioral changes. Yeah. Um, some of the other reasons why you don't want to hide behavioral changes. One is that you don't want to grow apart. Um, you know, if you think about two boats that are traveling together and then all of a sudden one kind of secretly and quietly changes course and it's never discussed. If you just think about time, if you let too much time go weeks and then months and then potentially years where you're secretly thinking and feeling things and secretly behaving in certain ways, sometimes over time you can grow apart to the point where that bridge is too wide once it's time to actually come clean. So you don't want to grow apart if you value your relationship. And, and that's a risk when you're having secrets. So secrets are bad. But the other thing is just very basic. A believer is always going to experience a faith crisis of, of their partner as a betrayal of trust. Even though you don't feel like you've betrayed anyone's trust, they're going to experience it as a betrayal of trust. That's enough, uh, that's enough of a thing that you have to restore and work on even though it's not fair. You don't want to add other feelings of betrayal on top of the one that you're already dealing with. So it's easier to just rip that Band-Aid off, have the hard conversations, get on the same page, come up with your new value system. We talk about this. Are you guys going to talk about values at yeah. some point? Come up with your new value system, agree on the behavioral guidelines for now. They can always change and don't betray their trust because you've got enough work to do to figure out the religious stuff without having a double whammy on the believer's perspective of feeling betrayed. Is that fair to say? Very. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Number five, uh, recognize the good in the church when you see it. Uh, post Mormons are real good about finding bad in good announcements. Uh, there, there have been a number of, just in the last couple of years, a number of changes that overall the, the, the change is a very good thing, uh, but we can pick apart every single little thing that is said or done by the church to find something bad in it. Yeah. And it's almost like if they're, if they're LGBT unfriendly, mm. we'll roast them. But if they make accommodations and reverse the November 15 policy, well then they're just, you know, they're just flakes. This is and proof that it's things not all that. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like the church can't win. We can't, Igno you know, acknowledge anything good sometimes. Right. And, and there certainly are situations where, or, or people that I can talk to, um, where I would break down the LGBTQ change and say like, well, now they said this, but it's that. But with my spouse, we were actually together when that change was made. Uh, we were just uh, headed over to a, like a thing at the kids elementary school and my KSL alert went off on my phone and I read that this has been reversed and we celebrated together. I'm just like, how great is this? This is a very positive, this is a very good thing. Uh, all of the point by point critical analysis can happen outside of, of this conversation. But to each other, it was a celebration. It was like, good for them, good for them. Wish it wouldn't have ever been in place in the first place, of course, but it's gone and that's good. Katie, why is that important for Alan to be able to acknowledge the good that the church does? Why is that important to you? I think that I take things so personally that when he acknowledges that something went right, that makes me feel good. It also tells me that he can think critically. He can good, be yeah. both supportive, but also critical of, of the good and bad things. And, and he can recognize um, the positive things happening. So I think that that's a really helpful thing for me to, to look at him as, as saying that uh, he can take a step back aside from his feelings and, and look at things in a critical I way. I love that. I, I love to tell non-believers you know, model the behavior and the respect that you seek. If you want them to be able to see the challenges with the church, if you want them to be able to empathize with the things you're struggling with, but you won't move an inch to ever acknowledge the good of the church, you're basically being a hypocrite. You're basically saying, come my way, but I'm not going to in any way come your way. But if you model objectivity, if you model openness, if you model a balanced perspective, you're actually modeling for them the behavior that you are seeking from them. Um, and so you just, you never want to become the monster you ran from. You always want 
uh, to make them feel safe. That's the biggest tip that I always give people with, with believing family and friends. Make them feel safe. And a huge way to make them feel safe is to be objective. Like you said, that's so brilliant. If you as a non-believer can be objective and see the good and the bad, you're going to help them feel safe to be objective as well. Mm -hmm. So many non-believers are wanting their believing spouse to consider the evidence, to see the problems with the church. That requires objectivity, so model it. Right. <laughs> yeah, then the, the last point goes along with that. It, don't dogpile if your spouse is ever critical of, of the Ooh, church. Ooh, that's, yeah, that's tempting, though, because it's like, yes, they're Ooh, finally, finally critical. Finally, I can talk so about So talk it. about that. So Yeah, I mean, very early on, uh, <laughs> if my rabbit hole experience, I discovered Lindsay Hansen Park's um, Your polygamy. polygamy Prop podcast, <laughs> and I binge listened to that thing so hard. And uh, I just wanted Katie to hear this and listen to it. I pushed and pushed and pushed, and that was, I mean, that doesn't work. So she was not in, his pla in a place to, to listen to it. But um, man, it was probably a year and a half later, in the middle of 2018 or so, uh, she had a, a close friend recommend that podcast. And she was then in a place where it was being recommended by someone that was not me, uh, that she said, I'm going to listen to it. And after a few episodes, she came to me and she expressed like, oh my goodness, a few of the things that she had learned and how difficult learning these things were. And if you, I mean, from our last uh, interview, John, my, my number one shelf item when it comes to church history was polygamy. And so hearing Katie say some of the things that I went through a year and a half earlier, it would have been so easy for me to just, yes, and try to connect the dots. And yeah, because if, if that's true and what you're seeing now is true, then that means this and that means X, Y, Z. Um, but I'm, thankfully, at, by that point, I was in a place, at least in that moment, that it was more just a message of, I am so sorry. That, that's got to be so hard. Mm. to learn these things. Like, I'm, I'm sorry that that's, that, that that's hurtful. And I, and I understand. I'm so sorry. Why is that important, Katie? Well, he's validating how I'm feeling. He's not dogpiling and said, well, if you, if you listen to this you episode, yeah, right. You <laughs> right. should listen to this. All he's doing is acknowledging my own hurt. He's empathizing, uh, the hurt that he also felt and he is not encouraging me or discouraging me to keep going the route that I'm going, or he's letting me decide on my own in a natural way, whether or not I want to continue to listen to this podcast or not. And that's huge. Right. Yeah. So a basic human desire is self actualization, sort of like free agency, if you want to call it that self-determination, nobody wants to feel like somebody else is telling them what to think or believe or to do. And even less, nobody in a marriage wants to feel like their love is conditional. So you as a non-believer should get that. You want to be loved regardless of your belief or non-belief, regardless of your church participation or non-participation. Well, guess what? The believers feel the same way. They want to be loved whether or not they believe, supported whether or not they, and they don't want to be nudged in any direction, just like you don't. So don't do it. Um, just be there for them and emotionally validate what they're going through and don't pile on and, and sort of say, good, now that you've got doubts or now that you have problems, let's take it the rest of the way because that's just going to make them withdraw again into fear instead of feeling safe and comfortable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's fair. Absolutely. I love it. All right, we're switching so, gears. Yeah, and okay. And okay. Obviously, the it's not comprehensive. The the tips. Yeah, yeah, we those can are keep good. Going and keep yeah, going, yeah, no, no, those are good. And we'll do other episodes on this too. So you can read your notes. Couple then. comments from listeners. Valerie writes: My husband and I have never known each other as well as we have had to since my faith crisis. It forced us to get to know each other on many deeper levels than we had before. So that's Valerie just reiterating this idea that the mixed faith marriage is actually a super fertile ground for a stronger marriage than you've ever had. That won't work for everybody, but it does work for those mm -hmm. who learn good tips, who get the support they need, and who navigate it with grace. Uh, Jody says, love these podcasts. Janet says, it is a respect thing. Respect is always important. Paul writes, Katie, will you let Alan come to my house to party one night? <laughs> This is Paul Pratt. Of course it is. Do you know who that is? <laughs> yeah, he's a coworker of mine, and Katie actually went to college with him. <laughs> Katie, he, he's expecting an answer. Am I invited? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if Katie can come, we're in. <laughs> I love it. And then I'll add one more. Uh, Janet writes, Alan and Katie are such a great example of a mixed-faith marriage. I appreciate hearing both sides 
so that I can learn. Uh, that's great. 